I'm assuming that all these snags are nicely undercut. Oh, that was another one just shown, just off the side of the spot. Whoa. Maybe it's not a little one. I'll tell you what, even though I was saying it, it felt a bit like spring yesterday, my hands are like daggers. Oh, there's another one. Yeah, just off the right hand side of the spot. I reckon they're feeding on the spot and just coming off the side of it and showing. He's woken up, he basically just swam in and now he's decided, oh hello. Whoa. Mate. So I am back winding here. <laughs> Feels like a good one now. Is either a turbocharged 20 pounder or well it's a good one I think. And another one. Yeah, they are right out there this morning. That one was a little bit longer actually, but and you hope and pray your hook holds are good as well, isn't it? Ten minutes in. Going round in circles under your feet. Come on, give your head up. Give me your head. Give me your head. There you go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, I hate it when they turn back over on themselves like that. Oh, that's only just nicked in the corner as well. Get in. Yes. You. Happy days. Those are the ones you come to Horseshoe for. That is a lovely carp. Oh, and I've got incredibly cold hands. <sighs> Jesus. Thick linear as well, or broken, like not just big single scales. Mega colours. Have a look at you. <laughs> look at him. That's what you come to horseshoe for, isn't it? Mega carp. Yeah, still, still all leached up. They all have been actually, the ones I've caught the last few weeks. Now's the time. <laughs> well, there you go. How about that? Take that first one all day long, but uh, this is what you come, yeah, to Lakes Like Horseshoe for. Amazing, beautiful old scaly creature. Really, really lovely, mega colors on him. Proper bit of character as well. Looks like it's been in here a good while. Huge old paddle on him as well, no wonder he rocked. A little bit bigger than the other one. I reckon 24, maybe 25 pounds, but yeah, whatever. You'll take ones like this all day long on, uh, yeah, on a chilly March day. Absolutely mega fish, made up with that. Right, let's get you back, get the kettle on. Ace. Right, first things first, tea. Was it? Oh mate, they are out there, aren't they? This is where I wish I had a bit more Tom Maker in me. I prepped all this shit in advance. That's the one. I've always been a really big believer over the years of having a really small range of really tried and tested and trusted rigs, certainly for my big fish fishing as well. You know, really, if I think back over the last sort of 15 years, I've only really used sort of one or two rigs um, consistently sort of week in, week out. And whilst this sort of, um, you know, low fluorocarbon combi rig isn't necessarily something that I have used week in, week out for my big fish fishing, it is something that I've always had in my bag and that I've always relied on in certain circumstances and certain situations. The fishing on Sanders back in the late 2000s really was sort of a prime example of the sort of situation really that was perfect for it. Um, for whatever reason, that spring, the fish didn't really seem to be getting caught over the sort of hits of bait and uh, just casting singles around at them was just the perfect way to catch them. So I was just fishing really light and mobile, often fishing a couple of different swims a trip and uh, the fishing there have always liked to show, which is great. So, you know, often it was just a simple case of, you know, seeing a few at first light, getting a couple of rigs out in the area with those little 12 mil pop-ups 
and um, yeah, I caught, I caught loads that spring. Um, some of the nice ones actually as well. Um, I caught Rosie, um, caught the, uh, the big linear, uh, the friendly. Yeah, and uh, a whole bunch of other 30 pounders, um, some of which actually have gone on to sort of become some of the real big ones in there in, in, in subsequent years. Uh, and I think because of the sort of hooked to landed ratio on the rig, it's just something that's always stayed in my armory ever since. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a real big believer in what your hook holds tell you. Um, and if you're losing fish on a rig, to me, that just isn't good enough. You know, a lot of my fishing that I have done over the years, you know, I just, I'm just not prepared to accept hook pulls, you know, um, especially on the kind of slower big fish fishing where you are only fishing for a handful of bites a year often, you know, you just can't have them falling off basically. And that rig has just always been impeccable uh, for, for keeping them on the end. Caught a few of my nice roach pit ones on it and caught some of the ones uh, from Red Beaches last spring as well, where I was fishing, to be fair, over a really similar mix to what I've used this trip with um, a little bit of crumb, a couple of 12 millers and some caster and a little pinch of maggot. And in the last few years, actually, um, I've noticed quite a few other lads using it as well. I mean, obviously combi rigs are, you know, something that have been in use in carp fishing for, you know, for 20 years. You know, it certainly isn't something, you know, that I've um, invented or anything like that. But uh, yeah, you know, obviously, you know, the likes of Daryl Peck doing really well on it with his, his, his variation of it with a slightly longer braid section, fishing it with the Balanced Tigers. I've seen Luke Valerie use it over on Dinton to really good effect as well, like catching some really big special ones on it. So yeah, I think because of the adaptability, because of the different ways, you know, that you can use it, I think it is a really, really good rig to have in your armory. Right then, there you go, number four. Bit of a different morning this morning. We ain't really seen a fat lot. A lot colder as well this morning. Um, but yeah, this one came to the baited rod. Just a few boilies sticked over the, um, the pop-up. Two singles haven't, you know, not a lot's happened on the two singles this morning. As I say, they ain't really been showing out there. Um, but yeah, nice to get one and nice to get one over bait as well. After a few plainer ones, it's nice to get a nice scaly. Let's get him back. Before I get this rod out, I'm just going to quickly uh, talk to you about the rig I've been using. Um, this is what I've been catching them on. Um, it's just a simple hinge rig, really. Nothing fancy. Um, great rig for Show, casting at showing fish which is basically what I've been doing the last couple of days um, you can obviously adjust the bead up the lead fishing it helicopter style like this um, you know as long as I'm getting a drop on that nice high pop up you know it, it's presented you can obviously adjust the bead as well up and down the leader depending on how dirty it is out there I mean I've actually been getting the bites off quite sort of choddy ground um, you know bits of dead weed and that out there a bit of silt um, but as I say, with that nice high pop up, relatively long boom, and the bead slid up, um, you know, as long as I'm getting a drop, an half decent drop, I'm pretty happy that's presented. Um, there's a couple of little things that I do slightly differently um, to most, I'd imagine. Um, and that's at the leader end here, I've got um, a double ring swivel. Now I tie my boom directly to that. Um, it's having the two rings eliminates the need of tying an extra ring, um, an extra loop, sorry, in the um, leader end of your boom. And you've got massive amounts of movement there um, because of the two rings on that swivel. Um, the boom is 50 pound XT snag leader. Um, now, previously I've used a hell of a lot of amnesia over the last few years, um, but recently Damo at Corda he actually suggested trying this to me, um, and I really like it. It's got many of the same properties of amnesia. It's the same diameter, 0.55. Um, you know, it's stiff enough that it doesn't tangle, yet supple enough that, you know, it still follows the contours of the bottom as such. Um, and it's 50 pound, whereas the amnesia is only 25 pound. So, you know, that can only be a bonus. Um, I've got a little bit of putty there in the middle of the boom. 
Now, that's optional really. Um, I, don't, I like to put that there because I know that, you know, if that, rather than kinking, potentially kinking up off the bottom, that little bit of putty will just keep it pinned down. Um, and then again, at the, the opposite end, the hook end of the boom, um, it's just tied directly to um, a ring swivel. I'm not sure what size they are. Um, is it size 11, is it? Whatever size, the, the, the small ring swivels anyway. Um, now, I've got one of the balancing weights on there. Um, I've actually been using a couple of different buoyancies of pop-up this trip. Same size pop-up, same, um, same pop-up. It's a, a 40 mil Ocean X um, from my mate Joe at, at Oxford Carp Bait. Um, but basically, the, the first tub of pop-ups I was using, which I've run out of now, um, was an old tub. They'd been glugging, glugging for years and um, they wasn't massively buoyant, so I didn't actually need any weight. Um, with those, the weight of the swivel was enough just to balance it out. Um, but, but this fresh tub I've started using, they haven't been glugging for so, so long and they're actually really buoyant. So yeah, little balancing weight just to uh, hold that down. Um, some 25 pound um, mouth trap. Probably what, two, two and a bit inches of that. As I say, quite a high pop up really, but you know, over that dirty ground, I know that's fishing, you know, that is fishing. This time of year, there's not, the weed is out there, it's just growing, but there's not massive amount of weed. Um, so yeah, as, as I mentioned before, as long as I'm getting a drop, I'm pretty happy that's fishing. Great rig to fish as a single or over a spread of bait. And the hook is just a size four Kamakura Chuddy, super sharp, ideal hook for rigs like this, choddies, hinges, etc. Um, and yeah, that's it, simple really. Right then. Let's get it out. When it's very brown, murky and turbid, I like to use pink. I like to use pink, a very, very stinky pop-up as well. Something like a crabby, tunery, horrible sort of flavour. Something that's really potent and will really stand out in that murky water. In the clearer water, I've always found like a yellow or a white to work really well. So I just like to take three colours really. Pink, yellow and white and chop and change them depending on the water clarity. Well, it's time for a move. Probably can't see out there, but I've got some geezer come right next to me. He's peppering the swim with boilies all over my rods, all over his rods, all over the lake, in the trees, everywhere. And the fish aren't here anyway, so I'm going to have a move. I had a look down the shallow end, saw nothing. So my only sort of hope is that they're in the deeper water, which I'm sure they are. So, yep, reeling in now. I'm going to go up there, try single look baits up that way. Just like all fishing, and in particular single hook bait fishing, location is absolutely key. On many of the waters that I fish, I've noticed that the fish can really group up in winter. So location is more important than ever, especially when you're single hook bait fishing, not putting any freebies around it. You need to get that bait straight on the fish. And you're always in with a chance of a bite. Single hook baits work extremely well in the cold because I kind of refer it to as a bit like lure fishing really. You want to catch their attention. So when their metabolism is really low, they're not searching for food, their energy is really low, you're just trying to catch their attention, get them to almost snatch at a bait. A bit like a zig really, a bit like lure fishing. Um, you just want that single hook bait in place, catching their attention, full of leakage, colour, and you want them to take it out of curiosity rather than when they're getting their heads down like in the warmer months. <laughs> it's a small one, but they all count. Oh, 
How come you've got a massive lump of mud on your head? <laughs> I just slipped over as I was walking back. <laughs> it worked though, lucky mud. Well, I'm just about to net it, it's pretty much ready and just goes to show the power of the single hook baits. I think this one took a white one, a white northern, out to a spot which to be honest just looked like it would hold more fish. You know, there's lots of wind pushing in here, there's a bit of an outlet that you could probably hear in the background. Just looked more lively here, even though I hadn't actually seen any fish, just looks like there's more life in this part of the lake and it seems to have worked. We haven't seen any carp today, the usual haunts haven't, haven't held any carp so I've decided to come at this end just on a bit of a whim really as like I said it just looked a little bit more full of life and um, a couple of liners and it roared off. There we go. Lovely little scaly one. Tiny, but it's beautiful. Look. Well, you join me on what finally feels like a bit of a spring-like Northwick. The weather's been a bit, a bit horrible of late. I've not managed to get as much time down here as I'd like to. I like to try and get a night or two a week, even in the winter, but I've been away a lot with shows. I've been away a lot with work. Uh, so it's meant that this is only my, my fifth night of this calendar year, but we're early March. And like I just said, it's now starting to feel like spring. The sun's out, standing down in the swim. It's really starting to feel like this, this warm day could get the fish moving. I've had very little to go on. It's nice to actually be here for a day to see if I can make something happen. Um, as I've got to be honest, of late, I can't really work out where my next bite's coming from. It has been a bit of a grill. I'm fishing very differently to how I fished last winter when I enjoyed some regular action through the colder months. I was always fishing over a very natural mix of baits, some worms, maggots, casts of sweet corn. But historically, James is the one that I'm here to catch never, if ever, gets caught over a decent spread of bait. So I didn't want to come back and do exactly the same and work for a load of repeat captures because I'm, I'm taking those captures away from someone else. Instead, I'm being a bit more single-minded. I'm, I'm going with very small um, patches of bait. I've been playing around with zigs, single pop-ups, solid bags, all the sort of things that I expect him to get caught up on. And whilst it hasn't happened yet, like I say, now's the time. He always does a spring capture. Um, I see no reason to doubt he's going to do exactly the same again. So even though I can't see where the next bite's coming from, being here at this time of the year, I might see my first show of the year today, I might see a patch of bubbles, there's always something you can, that you, you can almost make happen if you look hard enough. But with it feeling as warm as this, I've got one zig out there already, I'm going to get another one out there and adjustable, get it up in the layers because you never know. Tiny bit of heat, they start moving around and when they do that, they might fancy a little mouthful of bait. I'm going to get another zig out. Well, I've got a couple of different options out here already. The right hand rod's already on an adjustable zig. Um, there's still some water flowing in where we've had so much wet stuff. When I got here last night, just before dark, I could see that area was really chocolatey. Carp love that, that fresh water coming into a lake, so I had to have a rig down there. I've changed that for an adjustable zig this morning. And I've also got one really tight to the island margin now. Any fishing I've done over the years, they really start to look for the shallowest water when you get a day like this. So I had to have one there. And the reason I'm sacrificing this one is fishing as a little roving pop up on his own, but it's 12 or 15 foot down. And I just feel they ain't gonna be down there. I've got more chance in my mind, higher up in the water and with an adjustable zig, I can work the depth a little bit, just see if we can stumble across them. Because if you do, you can't have to make fishing easy. Get on the zigs. The adjustable zig's been a bit of a revelation. If anything, I'm very late in coming to the party, but I am at the party now. I'm pretty sure that I sat on here last spring, this sort of time, and I was going through a bit of a bit of a gruelling time and couldn't buy a bite. 
Come May, I started playing around with adjustable zigs and literally turned the remainder of spring around for me. I missed out on a lot of bites last year. I ain't making that mistake again. Come springtime, they're spending a lot of time up in the water, kind of they're moving around. Some of these fish probably for the first time in, you know, certainly in weeks. The lake has been doing the odd bite, just not to me. But there'll be quite a few fish that have sat, sat torpid, sat dormant for a long time. They feel the rays of that sun for the first time and they start to have a wonder. Now, if my bright boil is in front of them, who's in a bit of attraction? Who's to say they're not gonna fancy a snack while they're on their journey? Now, for me, a choddy hook, now I've been playing around with zigs for a bit longer, a choddy hook is absolutely perfect. You use a relatively, use a mono, I'm using the Cruiser mono in eight pounds, that's quite a light hook link, but it's still surprising how how stiff an eight pound mono is. So by having that outturned eye on the choddy hook, I just think the whole thing sits nicely in line, but being a Kamakura with that ultra sharp point, I think that is what's absolutely imperative. They're not pulling against a lot of resistance, they're not pulling against the lead, it's essentially a running rig that you're using. So I, I honestly believe that the sharpness of the hook is the most important part of this setup. Well, I suppose it is in most setups. Now lengthwise the adjustable is always the same. Taking advice from Ian Bailey when he was using them a lot, he simply clips it onto the uh, clips the hook onto the butt ring, comes down to the bail arm, ties that off in an overhand loop, but there's a very, very important reason for doing so. Now zigs are not only good in the daytime, they're really good at night as well. And adjustables are great in the day when you can allow everything to pop to the surface and you can see your float. But at night, you've got to rely on, a bit like paying up a marker float. You can see the line being taken, and when it stops being taken, you'll see it go slack at the end of the tip. Now, when you tighten down to that so it's just under tension, I now know that when the rod's on the rest, if I simply grip the line by the butt ring and slowly wind that back down, holding my fingers along the line, that as soon as my fingers get level with my bail arm, the hook bait is just under the surface, and then I can start to work it down using my foot marker to the height that hopefully I've just had a bite from. Hope that makes sense. Little anti-tangle sleeve on there. My rig simply goes over to the quick change swivel and that just ensures that it can't come back off. Bosh. I am just going to add a little bit of cork into this. Obviously this rig is absolutely paramount that it stays popped up for as long as I want to leave it in the water for. And whilst these pop-ups are very buoyant, they do have a lot of goo on, which can obviously affect the buoyancy. So to be safe, a little bit of cork, and I know it's going to be sitting up as long as I need it to be set up for. There we go, pretty much ready to go. Just one more thing before casting. Final piece is just to hold that in place against the little target box there, and you're going to foam it in place. So a bit of foam over the top of the whole thing. Get that to stick to the float, and that will stop any tangling. And then what will happen, once that goes in the water, that very quickly comes off to allow the separation, let it all pay up, and you'll see, if you can, you might not be able to see the hook bait, but you'll certainly see this on the surface, and then you start working it down. Quite confident with this. So once that goes in the water, this is very quickly gonna to melt to allow the separation. You then allow it all to come to the surface, and I'm gonna start it really shallow, just two foot under the surface. So once the float just disappears, I can wind the clutch down, and then make sure I'm two foot down and see exactly what happens.
that's not the clearest out there because I'm in the ripple, but I can see my float just on the surface. So I'm just slowly tightening my clutch down and my float is now just under the surface. But like I said, because I know the exact length of my hook link, I can now grip the line by the butt ring, holding that in place, tighten all the way down. And once I stop there, I know that my hook link is literally touching the surface. Now, as I said, because it feels so warm and it's so bright, I'm gonna start it just two foot under the surface. I've got a foot marker on my rod. So again, I'm gonna hold the line, wind it down one foot, two foot. I'm gonna put it in my line clip so it cannot move. Have a real tight bobbin and any movement on that can be a bite. But what I will do is regularly be adjusting that and this one not only up and down the water column, but I'll be changing the, the area that it's in, because I'll be honest, I've actually got no idea where the carp are, but if you can find the height they're willing to feed at, if I was, you know, if I'm lucky enough to get a bite today, very quickly, both rods will be sitting at that depth, and then you start to expect another. Lucky monkey in tow, we're on to a winner, hopefully. Although I've caught a lot of fish over the years on them, it goes right back to the quarry when I think of the one that, you know, meant the most and the one that really sort of sealed the deal for me. So I said earlier, I'd got to the point where I was catching a lot of fish in the quarry. And at the time when I went on there, there was a small head of the original carp left. Now back in the day, the quarry had a lot of big fish in it. When I went on there, it had a good head of big fish in it, but not the numbers it used to. I think at one point there was like 40, 30s or something silly like that. There was a lot of big carp in there, a few 40 pounders. When I went on there, the lake was kind of in a bit of a decline. I pulled off, it became day to get, and a lot of the fish sort of put the weight back on and came back through the ranks, got back to a bit of their former glory. But when I went on there, there were sort of 10 carp or so that I wanted to catch. And I went on there in February and I had until May. So I had, I bought a ticket off my friend He'd finished on there, he didn't want to fish it anymore. So I just talked to the owner and I said, look, can I buy his ticket? Can I have the last three months of his ticket? And he said, yes. So I bought the last three months of my mate's ticket and it gave me from the end of Feb, middle of Feb, something like that, until the end of April to catch all the carp that I wanted to catch out there. And as we neared the end of the season, I'd caught a lot of the fish on my list. Two fish I hadn't caught, so just so happened to be the two biggest ones in the lake. They hadn't been caught that year at that point, I don't think. In fact, no, they definitely hadn't. Um, the Pucker Common and Shoulders, that was the two. So the Big Mirror and the Big Common. Pucker Common was known for being a carp that doesn't get caught a lot. Now, the quarry fish at times could be quite friendly. You know, they weren't shy of a capture. They didn't, caught, they didn't get caught loads, but you know, they'd get caught a few times throughout the year. Whereas the Pucker was, always seen as one of the harder ones to catch. It might only come out once or twice. And it was in April. I'd got to the point where I was fishing, I'd run out of hook baits and what I was doing was reusing them. So I was, I'd catch a fish or I'd reel a rod in and rather than just whip the hook bait off and chuck it in the edge like I normally would, I was saving them. They're going back in the pot. And the reason I was doing that is because the little sequence I've just showed you about how I prep them, it takes a little while to get them to that stage. So I'm thinking, right, I've only got a little while left on my ticket. If I want to get these hook bait, if I want to turn back up the lake with hook baits that are ready to go, it's going to take me a little while. What's the quick fix? Reuse them. So I had a pot, I had a little bit of goo in it, and I would use the hook baits, drop them back in the tub. And I ended up catching the pucker common. But when I caught it, I was in a swim called the pipes which fished long to the island. So I was fishing 114 yards, I think it was. It was like max range with a fluorocarbon I had on. I was naked chod fishing. And I was in the swim one day, it was getting dark, and I'm sitting out looking at the water, I'm watching the island, because I'm always watching for the shows. That was how my fishing was on there. See a carp show, cast to it. And off the side of the island, about 30 yards off the side, something like that, over slightly deeper water, I saw a big fish come out of the water. I see it come out, you know, a good half its body, and by the size of it, by the colour of it, I didn't know it was the Pucker Common. I knew it was an original and I knew it was big. So in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, it could be that. It was a full moon at the time and I've cranked a rod in. In fact, by this point, I mentioned earlier that I was fishing 114 yards of the island with fluorocarbon. By this point, I'd actually switched over to 20 pound cart line because 
quite a lot of the time I was fishing at that sort of range, over 100 yards. And with the fluoro, and in particular with a wind, it was difficult. The max range I could get was about 114 yards. So the mono made it much easier. And although it was 20 pound mono, it still cast better than the fluoro. So I was actually spooled up with that at the time. And I see this fish show out to the right hand side of the island, a bit further than the island, and obviously on the angle as well, say 30, 40 yards off. I knew it was a big carp, so I put a rod on it and I put a recycled hook bait on there. And as I whipped it up, I remember like at first I was gutted that I was having to cast a recycled one. And then in the back of my head, I just thought, you know what, it doesn't matter. As long as it's one of them out of that pot, you're sweet. And I put the rod out. Can't remember how long it was out there, but it wasn't long. It was fading light. When I put the rod out, it was it just got dark as I netted the fish. But I had a bite on that rod. I played the fish for quite a while, netted it just as the light was fading. And sure enough, it was the pucker common. And of the two carp, of the big mirror and the big common, you know, if I could have picked one to catch, it would have been that. And I was absolutely made up. It was dark by the time I did the pictures, but as I said, you know, I caught it as the light was fading. And that for me, it was, I already knew, I was already settled at that stage about how effective these hook baits could be. But that just, it was almost the icing on the cake, you know. I'd have walked away from there, had I not caught, had I not caught that fish, I'd have walked away from there, knowing what I knew, confident in them. But to catch that, it just sealed the deal and it was almost a perfect ending for me on the quarry. And I did end up catching shoulders. I said a minute ago that the lake turned to a day ticket. So we filmed a thinking tackle on there. I think the first or second week that it went day ticket. So we hadn't, you know, it hadn't properly gone day ticket by this point. And I said to the owner at the time, I said, look, we'd like to do a film down there. Can I do it? And uh, I caught shoulders during that film, a thinking tackle film I'm sure a lot of you have seen. And I caught that on a white scent from hell pop up. Now, I don't remember why I was using that. When I look back, I can't remember the reasons for having them on because I know that most of the fish I caught on that trip were on the squids. But I put this rod out there. They were fizzing along the far side. Big sheets of bubbles were coming up. And I fired a rod out there and it took ages to get the bite. I think there was a bit of weed in that about. And by the size of the fizzes that was coming up, they were obviously you know, really rooting around, burying their heads and whatnot. In the end, I got the bite, played the fish in and it was shoulders. Now, as I said, I don't remember why I put a white one out there over a pink. I really don't know. But that summarises it quite well. You know, you're still going to catch on your hook baits that you use normally. You're still going to catch on your favourite hook baits. And, you know, on that day I did. I caught on my old favourites, which was the standard, sent from hell white out the tub. But something I learned during that period and something I've learned since is that if ever I need or if ever I feel like I need something out there that I have got 120% confidence in. What's going to get me the quickest bite I can get, you know, is that squid goo combination and give it a go. That's all I can say, give it a go. I don't use it every single day of the week. I use it a lot of the time, but there was something about it. If I'm going to use a bright pop-up or a bright hook bait of any form, it's always, always going to be one of them. Oh, well done, that's an awesome fish. <laughs> Just oh, get her head down in the water. Look, she's a very old lady, isn't she? We've got to let her get her breath back a bit before we let her go. That is a belter. A little bit oh. easier to talk now. She's yeah, you've got up. some of the way supported. Yeah. yeah, you did a good job there. Oh, that's I'm a cracking fish. So happy, I really am. Yeah. So, how old do you think it is? 40, yeah, 40 plus it's years old? It's over 40 years old. I mean, yeah. look at it. You it's know? a proper old <laughs> fish, isn't it? Look at it. Oh, well it's done. Incredible. Incredible. Well, you awesome. started your spring on here. You had the big comma, yeah. and now you've had the big mirror. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> Completely oh, good timing. Good, good timing indeed. <sighs> Can't believe it. Oh, time for you to get your rods out, mate. And uh, <laughs> yeah. after you start catching a few, I reckon. I should stop gillying for you. Well done. Yeah. Oh, should let her go. I reckon. Give it a couple of days and it's time to call it squits. I want a shower. I want to go to the wall pack and catch a carp. Um, I've not seen anything to go on. I'm now going to reel the rods in. I'm lifting the braid, the sinking braid up off the bottom 
because I want to like quickly reel it in and check my presentation. So I want to see if the baits smell nice, if they've been darkened, and because they're hinge stiff rigs with long booms, they should be sitting sweet, popped up inch and a half. And plus, for visual effect, if anything comes over them, and plus they're glugging, they're very visual, and the attractiveness over two days will still be leaking off this. Right, no tangles. Perfect. Right, dead area. Even though that was a nice drop, look, it's taken on the... It still smells all right, but it's definitely taken on some black. Hook's all right, no rusting. Oh, was a little... Um, no, not really. I'll check, check it for sharpness. Corrosion? No, that's bang on. It's just, it doesn't mean you won't get a bite there. It's not the worst area or anything. I mean, I've reeled in hook baits before and they've been black, like white hook baits, black. And, he, and they stink. It, this is still oozing, lovely. Smell of vision, Elliot. Mm. Right. I know all of. Ah, oh, what's that? Attention to detail. Always check the last. There, look. It's not bad or nothing. No, that's fine. It's just a tiny little bit. If that was like frayed bad, I mean, this is. Oh, nah, that's fine. But I'll keep an eye on that, that's fine. Gotta check your line. Braid, mono, check it. Check, check. So, all I've got to do next time is when I recast these, is just touch the hook up, put a new bait on, recurve it, check for its buoyancy. I don't like them to sink fast. I don't like them to sink slow, just like that really, I suppose. There you go. That's long range for me. I didn't know I could still cast that far. There you go, Lily, it's not tangled either. Oh yeah. It's not acidic down there at all. Oh mate, that spot's lush. Right, I'm gonna nip these rods in. Get on my gear in the van. I'll probably take a rod with me and I'm gonna just talk about where I've caught over there last year and have a little feel with the rods, just so I've got a bit more like info, knowledge for next time. I've got, it's definitely one spot I've got to check. <laughs>